Thank you, Laura, for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Anna, and I'm second year PhD student in Fabian's group. And I'm really um, pleased to talk today about our model collection, which is called Node Centric Expression Models, or in short, NSEM. And I want to start this off with a short motivation why our tool is even necessary and important in the field of spatially resolved transcriptomics. In the beginning of last year, spatial transcriptomics was called the method of the year by nature methods. And this also led to the creation of our TICE lab tool called SquidPy, which is an analysis platform for spatial transcriptomic data analysis in general. And this helped quite a lot to analyze image-based transcriptomic data and um, also targeted and spot transcriptomic spatial tra data. But most of the times you would focus on one particular image and it would be more around the image features or also the cell type features. So it would be really based on an individual analysis across different images. And sometimes you would also like to infer the cell cell communication events that take place in these uh, data sets across images. But you could only infer these based on connectivities and see which, name, which cell types might actually be close to each other in spatial proximity. But however, in this complete field and across these images, the communication event that really takes place is not really observable. And we have to define a method that infers communication events from these kind of data sets. So David and I, we said together and this project, I think originated two and a half years ago. So um, it's been quite a while since we designed this and we created this network um, called node-centric expression models, which tries to infer cell communication events from spatial transcriptomic um, data sets. So in this particular example I'm showing here, we would like to infer a communication event that potentially happens between epithelial cells, which are cancer cells in this particular example, and maybe different substates of T cells. Because you would see it just from looking at the images themselves that maybe there's a communication event taking place, but um, to which degree and to which importance they are taking place in the tissue um, is not observable from simply looking at the different spatial transcriptomic data sets. And this is where Ensim comes into play and why we designed this network and why we think this um, will be helpful to understand cell communication and spatial transcriptomics data sets. But maybe let's look a way back take a step back and how our spatial data sets even described and how they collected in spatial transcriptomic. Usually we have a segmentation based um, image data set. So individual cells are segmented based on different fluorescence um, channels. And then we get a segmentation mass of these individual cells. Then also in the pre-processing step, these cells are annotated. So we might have a collection of spatially resolved transcriptomic data that um, captures in this example we're showing here, immune cells, different substates of cancer cells and also epithelial cells. And now we would like to address an interaction event. In this case, the interaction between an immune cell and the repressed cancer cell, because in fact, the immune cell is causing a substate of the cancer cell that um, represses certain features of this cell type. How we, so now we are designing this. So we see that there is a spatial transcriptomic data set and we can based on this and on the segmentation mass, we can use SquidPy to form a graph of interacting cells at different length scales. This is what is shown here. And we'll define a graph of different um, cell types of the data set at different res so-called resolutions. This is the case because we want to describe the tissue variation in terms of different niches in the data set. So in this figure here, you would see that uh, cell two is described by its neighbors in the niche of a certain resolution. 
This is really important for us to define this communication event on different length scale to address also the variation we see in um, gene expression spaces in tr spatial transcriptomic data because we infer back from this um, these fine grained spatial vari um, variant states. Yes. So in this case, um, you would see that also we grouped the cancer cell to a joint um, annotation because we want the model to infer that there is a spatial variation that is dependent on the immune cell close by in the niche of a certain cell type. So we would um, group cancer cells to a general label together, and we would like the model to infer that um, an immune cell in close proximity is has an impact on the gene expression space of cancer cells. Okay, so what can we do now from this? As I said, we have the spatial graph of different cell types, and we defined ENSEM, the simplest ENSEM um, version, as a linear model. ENSEM covers several different model types of different complexity, and I will today introduce um, two or, or let's say three different types of architectures we have in our package collected. And the simplest one is the linear model. In this case, we define a function that describes uh, the fine grained um, gene expression space based on the cell type of cell and the niche you can observe through the spatial graph of cells. And those two information parts together then form the granular space and the continuous phase space of gene expression in our data set. And the way this is designed has quite nice features because we can directly access the parameters learned by the model and directly see in the parameters learned by the network the repression of an immune cell um, causing a different substate in a cancer cell, for example. Sorry, so, yeah, <laughs> sure. And this, how the cell type was defined in the first place? Is it based just on the gene expression? Um, I think, so we take pre-annotated data sets from different um, spatial transcriptomic uh, measurements. So we have tested six different targeted spatial transcriptomic data sets and the annotation was predefined by the original authors. And um, they usually, so you would segment a cell and then you based on um, gene expression space, you would um, cluster them and annotate them. Thank you. Yes. And yes, of course, interrupt me at any time, of course. And Laura, maybe if there's a question in the chat, you can also just ping me, thanks. Okay. So now, as I said, ENSEM is not only for targeted spatial transcriptomic data, but also for spot transcriptomic data. And I would now first introduce the concepts we have for targeted um, spatial transcriptomic data. And then maybe we can have a short question round and then show how we can then extend this to spot transcriptomic data. Yes, as I said, we tested six different spatial um, omics technologies across MERFISH, um, chip cytometry, MIBITOF, um, MALC, and CODEX. And the usual first step you would conduct with ENSEM is to run an ablation study across different resolutions in your data set to infer if the model can correctly, to, to identify if the model can correctly um, find length dependencies in the data set that are plausible with respect to cell communication events. And this is the usual first step if you want just to um, analyze if the model can um, identify these communication events. And we see that this also matches with an approximate um, cell radius. So we assume that a cell is around 10 micrometers large and ENSEM correctly identifies cell communication events that happen at longer length scales. And Interestingly, it also um, inferred correctly, for example, for the brain, for the second example, that length scales of communication events happen at longer length scales, just because maybe neurons communicate on longer length scales in total. This figure additionally shows um, a baseline model. In this case, the baseline is a similar architecture, but it does not have access to the information to the spatial neighborhood graph we built from categorical cell type labels. 
So this is also the first step that we try to um, identify the spatial signal in the data. Also, what I would like to hint here is that the delta R squared, so the delta variation explained is relatively small, but that is something we would expect from these experiments because we only add the spatial variation to the model inference stuff. And the variance structure in um, these spatial omics technologies usually comes mostly from the cell types themselves. And there's a tiny fraction of interest cell type variants. And this is exactly what we want to infer with NSEM. And um, so the data as squared is it's fine if it's relatively small, but it's important that you also see the, um, the peak at a certain range of um, resolution and micrometer. Yes. So this is the first step to identify certain length scales. If you now identified, so I'm showing here now an example for this Mibichov cancer data set, because this is potentially the most intuitive one. Um, if you come from a different uh, research field. In this case, it's collateral carcinoma. So they're looking into cancer cells, which are in this case epithelial cells. And the, in the original manuscript, they described interaction events taking place between CDA T cells and epithelial cells. And in the original manuscript, they had to analyze multiple images. So I think the complete data set spans across 64 images. And we run NSEM on this, the easiest linear network architecture. And NSEM correctly picked up the um, communication event between CD8 T cells and epithelial cells, which you can see in this figure. So we applied now NSEM at a range of approximately 20 micrometers, and we looked into the parameters inferred by the model. And we tested these parameters within a um, wall test to find sig significant um, changes in gene expression. And in this case, ENSYM then correctly picked up the signal. And ENSYM is also designed in such a way that you can find directional dependencies. One example in this case might be that um, there's only an um, influence from CDA T cells to other immune cells, but not the other way around. So these communication events might be just one directional, which is quite new, new, unique in the way we designed Ensem. So this gives you then the general overview about your data set, which communication events might take place. And since Ensem is designed quite nicely, the linear Ensem, that we can also address now really gene effects that were learned by Ensem. So you can directly um, call the center effects for a certain cell type. So in this case, you could see that epithelial cells have a, a particular sender effect on the CDA T cells. And in this case, it's also Ensem correctly identified genes that are important for this interaction that are also play a particular role and T cell activation. You can do this in both ways. So we can look at this in both directions, which is also quite nicely and this quite matches quite nicely with the ana analysis of communication events and spatial transcriptomic data sets. And interestingly, we compared this to um, a ligand receptor permutation test on the cell phone DB database. And just based on the database, particular genes that are important for um, T cell activation like PT, um, PRC are not annotated in this database, but we are not limited to only ligand receptor communication events. So we can um, apply this to uh, the whole gene panel that has been selected for the spatial transcriptomic data set and also uh, um, identify gene effects that um, might be related to just surface, um, surface interactions, or metabolomic exchange. So you can run it on a complete panel and not, you are not limited to only annotate, pre-annotated ligand receptor interactions. The next more, little bit more complex step was to um, directly model now this ligand receptor activity, because we saw that this might potentially be the next natural step to um, infer 
really act the ligand receptor activity that you can observe in spatial transcriptomic um, data sets. However, in to up until this point, the feature space you can um, observe with spatial transcriptomic data set, especially targeted ones, is relatively limited. So what we did is we um, imputed the whole transcriptome to a MERFISH data set on fetal liver with 10 gram. And in this case, we had a quite broad receptor and ligand space available on um, this spatial data set for the here shown um, cell types. And now we can use the receptor space and the ligand space and adjust the previously defined um, model that we use, the linear one, to a encoder and decoder structure. But in this case, we replaced the encoder by a graph attention network where the um, space of a cell itself is defined by its receptor space and the neighboring space is defined by um, the ligands annotated with um, previously defined ligand receptor interactions. And in this case, with the, um, the information on all receptors and ligands, we then infer the complete transcriptome of all cells. And it gives you then, because we have this encoder decoder structure, a notion on the activity and the importance of certain ligand receptor interactions in the spatial transcriptomic data set. And we applied this now to this imp imputed whole transcriptome MERFISH data set and com um, compared it to the linear ANSAM. So that was, again, the first proof of concept that it can pick up a communication event, which was the case in the linear ENSAM. Then the next model step would be a classical encoder decoder network, which I haven't showed here yet, but happy to address also in the question what the difference is here. And then also in this um, ligand receptor activity network. And what here is that the outperformance jumped quite quickly. So the baseline basically had only the um, receptor space available. So no information about the ligands. And if we add the spatial dependency with respect to the ligands to the network, we see a sudden outperformance. And interestingly, what I want to mention here in particular is that um, the baseline is usually is a little bit higher, but that's fine. So the baseline in this case would be a network that has both the ligand and the receptor space available. And from both um, feature matrices, you infer the whole transcriptome, but this is not constrained. So our model constrains it to really um, spatially interacting cell pairs and niches of cells. So we would expect that our architecture is much more constrained and therefore it might be a little less performing compared to the baseline that doesn't have this constraint, but also the ligand receptor interactions and the activity you can learn with ENSYM is much closer to the real communication event that might take place in your spatial transcriptomic data set. So um, we also think that this is the way forward to have a constraint on ligand receptor activity and not treat it as dissociated cells that com can communicate um, across endless um, resolutions. Yes, so that's for the targeted. I think now we can have a first round of questions and happy to take questions. Let me maybe stop. And I think also David is here. Any questions you can also just type in the chat. I didn't, Anna, can you explain the, um, what you said that the baseline is less constrained than your model? Yes, um, because the feature space in the baseline um, has much more access to, because the, you have the ligand space and the receptor space, and the baseline has access to both spaces of um, gene variation already and you're not constrained. So the feature space in this case is a little smaller if you have um, the constraint on the graph because you will remove some features from your input space. 
because it won't be able to see the ligands from the neighboring cells. Okay, because in your model, the, the, the radius is just constrained. Yeah. Thanks. And then also, um, so typically the baseline, the R squared is relatively high because this task is much less constrained because in the linear model case, you try to infer the, the continuous space of gene expression from just these categorical cell type labels. So it's a quite hard task for the model in general. Whereas in the ligand receptor activity model, um, the feature space is much um, larger. So you have already quite some variation explained from the receptors and ligands captured in the data set. And then you would expect to see a much higher R squared. Then I guess we can continue. Yeah. I'll let you know if there are more questions. I have a question. Okay. Uh, so I, I think you, you may talk about this soon, but uh, can you talk about, just explain the difference between targeted transcriptomics and spot transcriptomics? Yes, maybe let me share this one slide because then I think it, it's easier to understand. Okay. Yes, so um, this explains it, I think, relatively nicely. So. Let me zoom in maybe. So in targeted spatial transcriptomics, um, each observation is an individual cell. So usually how you would um, collect these data sets is that you have um, a fluorescence image, you run a segmentation algorithm on it, and then um, you get an idea where individual cells are located in the, state, um, in the image, and you can aggregate your features of gene expression or protein um, abundance. In spot transcriptomic data, like Visium is one example for this, um, each observation is not a single cell, but is a spot. And you can slightly see it here that each spot is a um, defined region in the spatial transcriptomic data set. So it's usually, usually a hexagonal grid and each spot can capture up to, I think, 10 or 15 cells. So it's rather an aggregate across multiple um, cells. And it is important that you not only run now directly the targeted version of Ensem on these slices because spot interaction is not really the same as cell communication because a spot can capture multiple different cell types. Okay, so, so for the spot, Atomics data, it is not on a single cell level. It's yep, right. uh, okay, gotcha. Thanks. Okay, but I think this is perfect. Um, perfect. Um, yeah, introduction to the second part of this because we um, address this now um, by, I think, a quite nice solution to this because it comes with downsides treating spots as cells and ultimately this is a different communication event taking place because a spot especially i think one example might be the brain where a spot is more a region label and not really a cell type label and what we did in this case if you have spot transcriptomics data we deconvoluted this spot transcriptomic data set with a tool called cell to location which is um a um, spatial transcriptomics um, data analysis tool, which works quite nicely and has also performed well in recent benchmarks. And the tool, what it does is it learns a abundance vector from a reference data set and uh, projects the abundance of certain cell types onto the different spots. And this will generate a, um, I think almost as targeted Special transcriptomics data set, but we'll come to this in a minute how you would apply this now to our models. And you will have for every spot, you will have an abundance vector giving you the proportions, so called proportions of the cell types present in each and every spot. So I visualized this here for two cell types, so B cells and CD4 T cells that have been projected onto the spatial, the spot transcriptomic slice. And you would see that in certain spots, there's a higher abundance for B cells, whereas in others, it's a higher abundance for CD4 T cells. 
and it will give you this abundance vector for each and every spot across these cell types. And this, we use this output from cell to location now to have a new version of the node-centric expression models where we have a graph of spots and we also have the cell types. And we know in this case, the cell types are no longer um, categorical because based on the output from cell to location, we cannot um, as assign each spot to one unique cell type, but we have multiple abundance vectors. And we use this as an input. So the graph of spots and the abundance vectors learned by cell um, to location to infer um, the gene expression across genes and cell types in this um, visium in the spot transcriptomic slides across spots. So with this, we try now to create communication events that take place in spots because spots cover up to 10 different cells. So within a spot, we assume that this is approximately a communication event taking place in this resolution. And we can now, based on the way this is designed, directly um, infer communication events and also the importance of certain communication events. Yes, maybe before I show some results we obtained from this, um, questions on this. Yeah, I don't get what happens in this arrow. <laughs> so the cell types were inferred by uh, cells location, right? Um, not correct, not a hundred percent correct. So what you have in cell to location is you use a reference data set, which is a traditional single cell RNA sequencing data set, yes. and you have on um, the, a similar biological system a visium slide across spot transcriptomics, and you use both um, to infer the cell type abundance in each spot. Yes, sorry, that's what right. I mean. type yes. abundance is based on some reference data set of what is the abundance of every transcript in every cell type? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now, um, and now you you're giving uh, this is a, a tensor, right? Cell type and genes and spots. An array. Uh, what are those gene levels? They are not the reference one you had before. You also adjust them a bit for what you see, and how do you distribute that across? Yep. That's quite nice because cell to location also learns a posterior over um, the inferred gene expression. So um, it will predict you the, based on the reference data set and also based on the spot transcriptomic data set, it will give you a posterior over the gene expression space that um, it associates with each cell type in the spot transcriptomic data set. Okay. Yes, so um, we are closely collaborating now with uh, Vitaly, who is the main author of Start to Location, which is, is a really nice tool um, for this kind of problems. Um, and I think also the benchmark they performed on his tool worked quite well. And we now try to see if we can actually find based on what cell to location, um, how it treats the spot and the reference data set, if we can identify cell communication events um, that are plausible in this, um, in this data set. Okay. So yes, so we applied this. And in this case, um, our first step would not be the um, ablation study I showed for targeted spatial transcriptomics data sets, but it would be only a comparison between a baseline model that tries to infer these posterior expression vectors learned by cell to location from only the abundance without the, um, without the um, neighborhood information. And the ensem in this case would have the information of the different abundance vectors within a spot. So it's a neighborhood designed just by a spot, which makes also based on resolution sense. And we compared this now across these uh, reference cell types, and we saw an outperformance across cell types for the spatial NSEM version compared to the non-spatial baseline. So the first step was, um, working well. And as a next step, we can then directly now 
based on the model architecture, look into the par parameters inferred by uh, this new ENSAM version based on deconvoluted spot transcriptomic data and look into communication events that were extracted from this tissue slice. And in this case, um, it's a lymph node data set. So it correctly captured a dependency between B cells and ma mast cells because they are showing some particular structure in this lymph node um, section. So this was correctly identified. Also, that is um, directional in this case. And then also what was previously previously described, um, a directional dependency between B cells and FTCs, which um, we highlighted also in our manuscript um, in this particular tissue. In this case, if you treat it like this, and if you pre uh, previously run cell to location on your spot transcriptomic data set, we can run all the analysis steps with Ensem in a similar way. And you will get an idea and an impression of communication events between cell types that might be present in your data set. And that can explain um, gene expression variation based on the spatial neighborhood. And in this case, what we also did just to show that um, ENSIM also correctly identifies sender um, profiles. So we compared different sender cell types. And then this case, because it was relatively granular, the annotation, and also um, it showed multiple substates of T cells, we compared the sender profile that different T cells had on um, B cells. And it's what is interesting is that ENSIM correctly identifies um, these T cell substates and shows that they have a similar sender profile on B cells in particular, which um, also is a, for plausibility, quite important to capture in this case. Yes, and I think, yeah, so our tool is publicly available on GitHub as well as on the documentation. And also we have a preprint online on BioArchive, which um, yeah, I'm happy to link you to at this point. And also, if you have more questions, feel, please be, feel free to approach either David or myself. We are quite happy to share more information on these new insights we obtained now with Ensem. And I think especially it's useful for an analysis tool that will become usable in the future that you can run on certain length scales. Um, where you might know already a certain length scale in your data set that cells communicate at, for example, 20 micrometers, then you can run NSEM to get an idea on um, communication events in your data set. And yes, I would especially like to thank um, David um, for this project. This was um, created two and a half years ago, and it started as my master thesis, and now we have it finally in a good place to complete manuscript. And it was a great journey. And I think we really created a nice tool that is now also usable directly on any spatial transcriptomic data set where you might have communication events. And especially also want to thank Fabian um, and the whole lab and everyone who collaborated on this project. And of course, Laura for inviting me here to talk in this community. And yes, I'm happy to take questions more on the tool we designed and also David.